Try to fight it, but you can't even feel it. Try to deny it, but it's coming for someone you love. Not the wisest to deceive. Can I hide away from you all in the silence? It's conceited Cause it believes that We're defeated To our surprise I believe that What's inside us Will release us now To learn for long time Have all but abandoned our small minds about nothing but fear Trying to run up a decline Maybe one day we'll learn the truth Maybe we're a blind by the sign Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sessions. This event is free. It's online. You're here with us. You know that, and more people will probably joining, and it's brought to you by F FITC. Really happy to be participating in this again. FITC has been producing events for digital creators of all kinds since 2002, and I think I've spoken at half of them. Uh, they brought thousands of designers and developers together at uh, 200 events in over 25 cities around the globe, as well as the online events that happened prior even to uh, uh, now, but uh, uh, have been heating up quite a bit. And today, one more, and it's ours. So I live in the world of holograms. I have been for the last few years anyways, and um, mostly by uh, the world of spatial computing with HoloLens and my role as a strategic design partner for Magic Leap. But today we're gonna speak with a company who's bringing a device to our, our desktops, our countertops, our tabletops for artists, creators, and makers. And, uh, so let's introduce them now, and that is the Looking Glass Factory. So today's session, before we get into that, today's session was made possible with help of sponsors, and we'd like to thank them. So let's thank Media Temple. Media Temple is looking for folks to join its partner program, which identifies and elevates the hosting experience for organizations that rely on numerous Media Temple services. So check the email that was sent your way before this event and find out more. Thank you, Media Temple. You've been a longtime supporter of FITC and this entire artist, creator, maker, developer community. And of course, we'd like to thank Looking Glass Factory for making this event possible. As you already know, we have Sean and Missy from Looking Glass Factory who are going to tell us more about what they do, their technology and their mission, and everything uh, that we came here to learn. Right, so let me tell you a little bit how this is gonna go. We're gonna have a 30 minute presentation from Sean and Missy. And then afterwards, there's gonna be a 30 minute q and I'm gonna ask your questions of them and you're gonna put your questions into the crowd class. And to thank you for submitting questions and to have a little fun here, at the end, we're gonna do a drawing. Anyone who asks a question, we're gonna put you in a hat, we're gonna draw out a name and you could have the chance to win your very own looking glass hologram display to play with at home. Okay, so one little bit of housekeeping before we begin, and that is that today's broadcast is being recorded and it will be made available to everyone following the session. So if you missed part of the presentation and would look like to check it out again, you can do so 
just by returning to this very same URL here. Okay, great. Let's begin. I'd like to introduce to you Missy and Sean. Missy is a multidimensional artist, literally. <laughs> She's a pioneer in art for 3D and was the first person to create holographic stop motion videos, narrative fiction pieces, and dozens of other art experiences for Looking Glass. And Missy studied at the Literary Arts at Brown and has a master's degree in game design from NYU. And she's been using the Looking Glass as a tool for storytelling, including hand-drawn holographic narratives, a 3D tarot reading or game, and a 3D stop motion film. Uh, check out her game, Love Self. It's amazing and I think very right for the time. I hope we hear more about it later. Sean. Sean is a graduate of MIT and he is inspired by the movies from the 80s and 90s uh, to build a holographic display. For over 20 years, he's been working on this and he got to start with a classic laser interface pattern holographic studio he built in high school. Followed that up with training and advanced holographic film techniques at MIT. He has been awarded dozens of patents around the world, including the Popular Mechanics Breakthrough Award, one of my favorite magazines from when I was young, and noted as one of the 20 best brains under 40 by Discover Magazine. Sean serves as the co-founder and CEO of Looking Glass Factory, working between their Brooklyn and Hong Kong offices. All right, and a little bit about Looking Glass. They were founded in 2014. They're headquartered in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, with operations in Hong Kong as well. And in 2018, they launched the world's first desktop holographic display dev kit. In 2019, they started shifting the, shipping these 8K light-filled displays. And in 2020, they launched the Looking Glass Portrait, which is a personal holographic display. And they really love holograms. All right. So today, they're building a world in which everyone from LiDAR photographers to developers to just creators and makers can live in a holographic future. And while a lot of big companies... I mentioned earlier, have put forth AR and VR headsets as a solution. Um, what they have is a much different approach. And it's one of the interfaces of the future that won't be worn on your head 16 hours a day and instead sits lovely in a calm way in your room. Okay, so for now, I'm going to hand it over to Sean and Missy. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to your presentation 30 minutes from now, Q&A, you guys. And when you ask your questions, if you think it's a question for Missy or you think it's a question for Sean, put that in your question. Otherwise, if it's for both of them, you don't have to mention that. All right, thank you very much. Missy, Sean, the stage is yours. Great, thanks so much, uh, Jared, appreciate it. Um, excited to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, go into a little bit about um, how we, our journey, towards unlocking the hologram, um, which to all of us in the Looking Glass Factory team is the idea that you could have a field of light uh, that represented a three-dimensional world, someone maybe across the world from you that you're not in the same physical space as, um, and this whole world of 3D content without having to put on a headset to experience or share it. Um, and it's taken us about six years um, to uh, figure out how to get to that destination point along with the community of 3D creators that has really been a part of this journey with us empowering um, all of the advances that we've been making. Um, so I'll cover a little bit about the history and then Missy's going to get into some of uh, the exciting stuff that's been coming out of the hologram hacker community in the early days. And then uh, we'll dive into um, some more about Looking Glass Portrait and um, some experiments that uh, Missy's been running that are representative of what a lot of folks in the community are pushing forward. Um, so let me dive in. Uh, so when we started um, back in 2014, we had no idea how to get to the dream of the hologram, the thing that we know from the movies. Like uh, for me, it was Back to the Future 2, where Marty McFly is getting gobbled up by a holographic shark. Um, we had no idea how to get there. So we had to communicate what the essence of this idea was. So we made a static version of what we viewed as the hologram. And here's a holographic or volumetric print of a frog made of a bunch of slices of lucite in a uh, lucite um, uh, block there. And we um, were able to pull in a lot of folks artwork um, and get you know, roughly a thousand or so of these out into the world. But 
the problem with this um, technology of volumetric prints was it was static. You couldn't snap your fingers and have that frog hop um, or snap your fingers and change it into uh, a volumetric video of someone who might be across the world from you. And that's really what we wanted to figure out. Um, so we started to do a number of additional experiments. So this one was called HyperTube 2015. These are hundreds of LEDs that are flashing at thousands of times a second um, to represent, in this case, a, um, a three-dimensional scan of a friend wearing a hat. Uh, pretty lo-fi at the time and a little bit dangerous. Um, this is a sort of bulletproof casing around this thing, and it was not quiet. Um, but it got us closer to the idea of an updatable volumetric or holographic display. Um, we did more and more experiments. That's, a, that's the first um, communication, a holographic video call just across the room <laughs> uh, in a prototype system that um, we had made in the team. Um, and that's a, you probably can't tell because it's so lo-fi, but that's me um, in there uh, captured with uh, Connect. Um, and we kept progressing and uh, started to figure out how to make the holographic content extend beyond the physical bounds of the system. This was a system called Hollow Player One, full interactivity. Um, and I actually practiced drawing that hello uh, about 500 times to get it just right. It wasn't a super reliable system, but we got um, a decent number out into the world and learned from the creators in our community about how to make it better. Um, here's another uh, shot of that system. Um, and then we figured it out. Um, this is uh, the first dev kit looking glass. We gave it the name of our company, which is Looking Glass Factory, because we uh, realized that we had um, crossed the threshold into achieving that dream of the hologram that we had seen in movies. So this frog, this is still one of my favorite apps it's called Frogo. He's reacting to uh, a flame on my virtual hand and my hand is being tracked there with um, a peripheral called Elite Motion. Um, this frog was created in Maya and Unity and then brought into the real world in this, uh, at the time, prototype looking glass from 2018. Um, a lot of our friends made artwork with a bunch of different platforms um, and uh, different tools. So in this case, this is a friend, Jeff Chang, who made this uh, really, really cute red panda um, fish, fishing for sushi on this conveyor belt. Um, we actually got pins of this red panda. We loved him so much. Um, and uh, he created um, the red panda in Maya and we pulled it in through our Unity plugin. Um, how does this thing work? Uh, well, um, VR and AR headsets work by presenting two views. Well, let me back up. The screen that you all are seeing me on now is presenting a single perspective to you, and that's why it feels flat. VR and AR headsets and a lot of conventional 3D works by sending two perspectives into your eyes, and in some cases, those change as you look around the world and an object. But it's still two views at one time, typically with a head-worn uh, head device. The looking glass is different. Um, the technical name for our technology is a light field display, and it works by presenting dozens of perspectives of a three-dimensional scene and pumping those out into the world simultaneously. So basically, depending on where you stand, you see a different three-dimensional stereoscopic view of whatever it is you pulled into the looking glass. And uh, this is really powerful because there's never been a interface or display or canvas that's been able to, four groups of people, represent three-dimensional content in all of its glory, like pulling it out of this unseen 3D digital space and plopping it into the real world. And that's what the looking glass um, was intended to do. And that's what uh, we think it does. Um, we knew we were uh, onto something when we started to put prototype looking glasses out into the world. These are just a few clips that um, we grabbed the other day, but people went bazonkers over the looking glass and not only viewing content in the systems, but starting to make content at a furious rate in this new, um, uh, holographic display platform. And um, we started to develop more tools to enable more and more creators to develop more and more content for these systems. And with that, I will hand it over to Missy. So as you can see, um, this is Unity. Uh, we had a lot of Unity developers on our team. So it made sense that Unity was 
making a plugin for Unity was one of our foundational tools. Um, it worked pretty simply using uh, just Unity mechanics. Any Unity user had a really easy user flow using it. Replace the camera with our hollow capture, and then voila, you got your Unity project uh, displaying holographically in the display. Um, this kind of led to a lot of experimentation, including in volumetric video in the display, um, which really blew people away. As you can see in the next slide, uh, this is not synthetic. Uh, a lot of people when they first viewed this were convinced that this is uh, 3D um, creation, but this is a real capture. Um, and it, it really just, um, I think communicated for people the real potentials of head gear free uh, 3D in, in general. And then here comes my more uh, zany experimentation. This piece is called Third Eye. Uh, I was really at the time passionate about exploring narrative and emergent narrative in the holographic space and was also recalling the fortune telling arcade systems that I'm not sure if anyone remembers Zoltan. And so it kind of led me to this uh, 2D tarot reading character in a 3D psychic space where um, with elite motion, you pull three randomly generated cards and you had this emergent narrative that is your fortune that would emerge. Another really cool piece by uh, developers that we work with named Kevin and Fernando. You might know Fernando for his piece, Panoramical. Um, this was a really amazing experiment on using peripherals with the display. This is a MIDI controller that allows you to uh, basically adjust this like alien, aquatic, ambient, really cool scene um, with the knobs, or you can let it alone and let it do its own thing. But really got us excited about the potentials of um, all the different ways in which you can interact with the holographic display. Uh, this ex this is a wild experiment. Uh, another example of trying to push the boundaries of narrative. Uh, I took so many light fields I can't even dare to count um, in order to make this 3D stop motion um, animation that I, I basically strung all the light fields together in Unity. And um, you know, it it really was this time in which we were trying to figure out and push the boundaries of narrative and interaction and visualization and, and as, a, as holograms in this new space. And uh, as we were doing this uh, work, especially um, in terms of 3D engines, it became increasingly obvious to us that we also needed to unlock 3D tools for people that create 3D in Blender or other um, 3D modeling software. So that led us to this creation of Model Importer, which is a tool that allows users to import their OBJs of their GLTFs and other file formats and view them um, animated and textured and as holograms immediately. Uh, so all that to say is uh, our early adopters were people that uh, really found a lot of value in, in showcasing their work in 3D and sometimes understood value even better than us. Uh, people started to write it in to us about hypothetical use cases and science visualization and medical visualization that, um, you know, for us, we, we wouldn't know. Um, and they, you know, we're also exclaiming how much benefit that these practices and interest industries would be benefited by headgear free 3D immediately. And all of them started to ask, uh, how big can these be? Uh, is great, there great question, Missy? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and we answered. Uh, we practiced that before, but I missed my cue. Uh, uh, we we answered with a new system um, that was a larger um, version of holographic uh, display, um, and this is the Looking Glass 8K um, that we launched about a year, a little over a year ago, um, almost a year and a half ago. Um, and it's a 32 inch system and works with all the same software tools that we have for all of the other um, systems, but it started to feel more and more like a holographic window into another world. And you can see all types of wonderful, like truly, truly wonderful um, uh, holographic content represented here, some which we made and some that was made from companies, some that was made from individual creators in the community. Um, 
And we were so, so excited about getting this into people's hands. And we started to ship a small number of test units um, to folks in um, all sorts of fields, uh, medical imaging, um, computational chemistry, um, folks who wanted them for big um, experiential um, uh, art installations. Um, but then right around this time, uh, the pandemic hit and um, not a lot of folks were going to places. Well, nobody was going to places to see large holographic displays anymore. So we um, changed tactic a little bit. And instead of making larger and larger and larger displays, um, we chopped it up into a bunch of pieces and um, created a new system that we call Looking Glass Portrait. And uh, I think there's a video that we'll play here. Over the last six years, we've developed a new type of technology. It works like a magical looking glass. By controlling the direction of millions of rays of light, what you see through it becomes as real as the world around you. This is the Looking Glass Portrait, your first personal holographic display. glass portrait generates dozens of perspectives simultaneously. This results in a three-dimensional hologram that floats out of the display, viewable by multiple people. No headsets required. I'm Sean Frayne, and I'm part of the team that created the world's first holographic display back in 2018. And it's all been leading up to this. This is a memory machine. And it's a tool for holographic exploration. And it's a new canvas for 3D creators, all wrapped into one device. This is the Looking Glass Portrait, and it's your first personal holographic display. Uh, so as you can see from um, the, the video clip, uh, a, there's a lot of stuff that folks um, uh, started to do and could do with this new bite-sized system, which we just launched a few months ago. And um, in addition to this being um, kind of like a, a iPad mini size holographic display that could sit on your desk, um, still use all the, the software that we were talking about. We started to make additional tools to let uh, a wider swath of creators create holographic content. In this case, this is a um, converted um, uh, image of uh, Fauci into a hologram. Um, I actually took this photo um, I think in December of this Lego clock uh, sitting on my bookshelf and posted it on um, Twitter and people started to go berserk because this photo and the depth map, the grayscale sort of depth map that you see on the right um, was taken with a single iPhone photograph. Behind every uh, portrait mode photo, there hides three-dimensional information normally used to blur out the background on photos like this, but that we could repurpose uh, through some new software tools that we rolled out to the community to transform those photographs, and in some cases video, into holographic uh, photos and videos. And this really widened the aperture of 3D creators that could start to create for this system. And we're really at the very, very, very beginning of this. Um, and um, I think Missy's going to go into a little bit more of 
the stuff that's happening right now? So, um, no, that's not a carpet on my head. That is a scarf. Uh, this is a piece that I shot in my bedroom, um, which, you know, looking, I'll, I'll probably look back as a sign of the times where I had to be my own model for my volumetric captures, um, where I was just at a, a Azure Connect, some lights and a green screen in my uh, two bedroom apartment. Um, and this was an experimentation on, on uh, depth and really trying to, uh, figure out what the best way to capture depth alongside RGBD um, was. So the scarf, I tried to place more in the foreground and lead all the way to the background. And I immediately saw really incredible results um, and was already looking for more and more ways to capture and edit it as holograms. Uh, when my prototype first arrived, it's an understatement to say that I was blown away. Uh, it felt like um, you know, as Sean said before, uh, truly a window into another world and a world in which I could create and capture for it uh, using iPhone capture, depth cameras, Blender, Unity. Um, it was almost so many, there just so much diversity in tools and like creation that I could, I didn't even know where to start. But I really did start with iPhone. Um, if you remember a couple slides back, uh, I mentioned two really amazing developers named Kevin and Fernando. We worked with them to, and they developed uh, an amazing application called Diorama, which allows you to drag or import an iPhone photo or an RGBD image into this application and edit it in, in Z space and also with dynamic lighting and also add GIFs um, and such. Um, so I started to do a lot of uh, experimentation like this. And honestly, it was the first time I had ever edited lighting on a, th a 3D photo that I had just taken as an iPhone portrait. And I, it definitely opened for me, like I saw hologram uh, photography editing kind of open up for me as this thing that's, you know, not just like in Photoshop where it's, you know, on a 2D screen, like now we have this whole Z space um, open to us for our artistic expression. Um, you know, at the same time, I got my hands on an iPhone uh, 12 Pro, and I started voraciously looking for apps that utilize the LiDAR scanning that Sean uh, mentioned above in the, the Lego photo. And I was definitely met with some incredible results. This is uh, a scan of my face. I was trying to put on different makeups and um, do a lot of, I was definitely pushing like what I could do and how I could scan and how uh, high fidelity I could get scans with um, this, this application called Bellis 3D. And then uh, around the same time I was doing these experimentations, almost like uh, where, you know, people in the, that are excited about this are connected psychically across the world. A member of our community uh, mentioned this app called N3D, which also uses LiDAR scanning and it does full body scans. So I scanned myself in 3D, uh, added a rig to myself and, you know, for an internal hackathon project. I'm a DJ, so I created a, uh, something I imagine would be a virtual DJ set space um, that anyone could view across the world on their desk. And obviously I made it a little weird and zany because that's my style. Another really amazing uh, app uh, that utilizes LiDAR and just the uh, Face ID technology on the front of Phones, on the back of the iPhone 12 Pro, the LiDAR technology is Record 3D and uh, it, it captures depth maps, um, but instead of photos, it's videos. So this unlocked uh, just uh, the ability to take videos anywhere you want, like you would your photo in 3D and pull them uh, in as holograms. Um, this is an experiment of me testing uh, depth as I do. Um, and so at the same time, uh, amongst my own experimentation, I was also, uh, I had the amazing opportunity to work with Blender artists um, and work with them to pull in their, uh, their Blender scenes into the display. This is uh, a piece by an artist named Adus. I highly recommend you follow um, this artist. It's really amazing. And he uses grease pencils, uh, techniques to create really rich and vibrant 3D worlds. And I definitely felt when I first got his work into my display that I was just, I had a window into these, these worlds that he's um, building. And then the, another artist that 
we were working with named Mar. Also highly recommend you follow and support this artist. Um, I This was actually a very emotional experience for me because her work was actually one of the first blender scenes that I was able to pull into the portrait and how vibrant and how um, compelling this felt on my desk. I, I truly felt um, the potential of so much diverse artwork um, existing in a holographic space and coming to life, a life, coming to life in a new way. And I, I felt genuinely lucky to have been one of the first people to experience this. And I, I told her that. And a few weeks ago, beta testing began. And in a few more weeks, the first wave of portraits are gonna be rolling out to the hands of the earliest adopters. And this group, along with you, will be the pioneers in the holographic we see pushing the boundaries of 3D. And, and that includes interaction, capture, art, design. And I'm, I know areas that I can't even imagine and express yet. This is a picture of our door for our first lab um, five or six years back. And this has been our motto since the beginning, no dystopian futures allowed. Um, though we're excited about the future, if we've learned anything from this past year, it's that you can't really plan um, for the future or anything. Uh, but what we do know is that holograms are real and that fact alone means that anything is possible. I really identify and resonate with your closing statement, you know, I'm really fond of thinking about the bright future of technology and how it, uh, it could live to serve humanity. And there's nothing better than just living in the present and creating amazing things. Thank you so much for that lovely presentation. There's now a whole bunch of questions, 25 of them at this point, and there's been a really good discussion in the uh, chat panel about the history of 3D photographs and the ability of technology to make things seemingly magic. So we know in the world of art, everything old is new again, and we know in the world of technology, when it works really well, it just appears to be magic. So the questions are basically, it. let's start a discussion here. I've got my chai. I've got my maple syrup to put in my chai because of FITC being a particularly Canadian company. <laughs> and so uh, uh, the questions have come in, Missy and Sean, really in about three categories. One way we could call conceptual, theoretical in the space. There's a lot of tactical questions here and there are a couple of business questions. So let's start with some of the conceptual and theoretical. And there's three questions in here that we could probably combine into about one. Uh, Maurizio asks, how can you integrate holographic technologies in a room in order to enhance the living experience? Um, uh, Andrew asks, uh, with holograms being used to create performances of Tupac and other artists, what at what point are we really dead? <laughs> and is digital eternal life something we should be planning for, right? And then... Um, uh, Osuna asks, what do you consider this amazing technology, uh, the impacts you to have in education? And um, uh, uh, let's see, there's one more here that asks the impact on the entertainment industry. Karen asks, what impact do you envision this technology having immediate? So let's combine those all and basically give us a little layout. Like, where do you see the future of this technology? and holographic displays in general in terms of, of changing our setting at home, our settings in entertainment, and rather philosophically just how it might impact the world. And Missy, I want to uh, start with you and Sean, you can follow up. Um, it's so funny. I just actually did a free writing exercise thinking about this. Um, you know, I, I kind of think of about the, the holograms in our life just being another way to act, a new way to access um, things. You know, we're so used to capture and um, 3D expression um, being kind of limited to a screen. And for me, this is a whole new world of being able to have them all exist in real 3D on your desk. So, you know, I don't know if this fully answers the questions for other people, but for me, that means that 
I'm um, creating for 3D to sit on my desk. I'm sending 3D that's supposed to live like this to other people in my life. Um, I'm able to express my my um, uh, interest in Z space to my father better um, because you know otherwise he's like, what are you doing on that screen? Um, yeah. As an artist, does that for you does that make it feel like you have a more direct emotional connection with the viewer by moving it into three dimensions? Direct emotional, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, there's a, there's a feeling that happens in my stomach. I can't speak for anyone else, but when people make stuff 3d and they, and I get to view it on my, uh, my looking glass portrait, there's a feeling I get in my stomach that feels novel and it feels like I'm actually, I, it's sitting here, it, it exists. And I think that, yeah, that, that would be transported to the audience. Um, this is something that also is in, is in real 3D too. So that's my vague, ineffable answer. I love it. I love it because, you know, in the we live in these 2D boxes now since the pandemic began. And sometimes you feel like there's an uh, uh, actually a human energy that doesn't get transmitted. And I, I think what what you've recognized and, and seeing in the display is that once you add a third dimension, there's another bit of that layer that comes through. Okay, Sean, your turn. How is looking glass, this portrait or holographic display in general, going to change the worlds of entertainment, education, and, you know, just our living rooms. Yeah. Um, you know, just to, to Missy's point before I dive into that, uh, um, when we're trading, you know, this is all very nascent, right? So it's just, a, it's, a, it's a community of, it's a niche community right now of thousands of people, but it's not like millions of people yet. So as we're trading stuff with each other, to, to me, it feels like I'm giving someone a gift and receiving a gift rather than sending someone a file when I create and share a hologram. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's hard to, to know how that's going to scale and whatnot as more and more folks start to use these systems, but that it is a different feeling than um, sending someone a digital video file or whatnot, to, to me at least, and I, I think um, to a lot of us in the team and early community. Um, how, and so that sort of touches a little bit on how it's going to transform entertainment, how it's going to transform our homes and, and what have you. Um, the name of our company is Looking Glass Factory and the name of these things are, uh, it's a looking glass. And that comes from the idea that, or the dream that, um, you know, one day it will be possible. It happens to be like now, but like when we made the company initially, it was like one day it's going to be possible to have these views into this unseen 3D digital space uh, or these views from my physical space here to your physical space. And it won't be that we're represented as um, little two-dimensional glowing rectangles on the screen, but it'll feel as if you're sitting right across the table from me or that something I've created in Blender or in Maya or in Unity is sitting in your room and your family can see it, your friends can see it, your colleagues can see it, um, just as if you're looking at a real physical object or person um, sitting there with you. So we're, we're getting pretty close to that, honestly. And I think it's going to go from being something that is this weird esoteric technology that folks aren't even sure is possible. Um, that's kind of the phase that we're at now to being something that hopefully um, is just understood as the fabric of creation and communication. Absolutely. So <laughs> for the audience, I definitely heard the answer to these questions in Sean's answer. And it was when he described looking glass factory. It's up to you to decide how this will impact educational settings. The capability is now there. And so I think we can all imagine a lot of really good ideas from like, oh, can, can you actually now um, do a dissection di digitally? you know, which would extend the number of people could actually be exposed to biology in high school, right? You can now uh, 
uh, miniaturize a concert venue and sit it on someone's desk, which expands the audience and the way that the artist could be presented. And Missy gave us that great answer of how like it's just a greater emotional co connection to the photograph. So one last conceptual question, and then we'll go into a stream of tactical questions that should be pretty easy to answer. And this one's going to come from me because I get at least one question as the presenter. As someone who spent a lot of world time in the heads up display world and eventually these things get down to here. And you should know that I also have done a bunch of stuff with projection. So I'm not overly biased, but what, what's the difference between having a display on your desk and having a display on your, your, your face? Where, where do you think there is that extra uh, uh, um, reason um, to, to have something sitting on your desk? I guess I can take a shot at this first. Um, I mean, all of these, all of these things, these next generation displays, next generation interfaces, are part of the future in different ways. You know, we have laptops, we have phones, we have, um, you know, uh, big screens, little screens, and whatnot now. And that's how the next generation of systems is going to be as well. It's going to be this diversity of tools um, for. A uh, looking glass, it's unique in that it's persistent for a group of people. And in that way, it's more similar than dissimilar to how we've um, communicated and created with one another in the past. You know, we gather around a campfire or a fireplace and tell stories to one another. We sit around a radio and listen to the ball game. We talk to someone on FaceTime with our, you know, family and friends, like running behind us and saying hi. Um, so this is uh, an evolution of that. Um, it wasn't clear if this was possible um, a few years ago, but now that we know it is possible, I think it's going to be looked back on 100 years from now as being like, oh, of course, that is a critical element of the next stage of evolution um, for how people, like for interfaces. And that doesn't mean that VR and AR headsets aren't part of the mix as well. If you want to dive into a virtual world, then you gear up. But there's friction there. Um, there's... Uh, you know, someone can come behind you and tickle you. Um, I don't know. Uh, there's um, all of these, there, there's these different um, ways that you interact with that technology. And so, um, you know, we're excited to push forward I, this additional pillar. I totally agree with you. I think, you know, you, I think you, you've nailed it, that we can imagine a future where we're all wearing holographic capable glasses looking at one of these displays because it is a totem, but also because it is a um, a affirmative shared experience without, without any debate or quality. We understand that we are all cooperatively looking at the same interface, which brings me to you, Missy, an extension of this question. Have you played with or could you imagine, um, you know, it has its by nature cooperative experience. Like you're, you're, you're pulling, uh, there's nothing like getting a tarot reading with your significant other, right? And and have you thought about some cooperative experiences for the device? Um, so there actually have been uh, cooperative experiences created for the device with VR headsets, and they work quite well. Um, so I I it's not, I not only can imagine it, it already exists in the back of my head, and I'm I'm we're like really excited to explore. Um, how much further that can be pushed. Not the the piece that um, I'm thinking about uh, is a draw a shared drawing tool um, on the holographic display and with the I think the tilt um, controller correction. And that was I think that that really bridged a gap that we or tr it aimed to bridge a gap that we saw as a barrier. Because, um, you know, I can speak from personal experience. I have developed on the HTC Vive and I have shown my mom my work in the Vive. And I've also shown my mom my work in the um, Looking Glass. And it's a, it's a different experience. Um, you, wanna, you wanna participate with this person experiencing, this is as an artist, um, experiencing your work. And so I, I definitely think there's a way to continue looking for to continue exploring how to bridge um, those avenues between VR headset creation and, and um, holographic display, but share uh, yeah shared answer. experiences yeah. a good answer um, shared experiences are amazing and there's nothing like light that has traveled 
uh, a distance before it reaches you. That's your campfire, Sean, because the universe is made of light, right? And uh, all kinds of vibrations. So there's a lot more merging that happens as it comes to you, including the the emotions of the other people in the room. So I, I do think I, I wanted to ask that question because I, I you know, I, you get you get the feel sometimes like, you know, should I invest in a technology based on will it be around? I, I know that's not your your goal because like, why not make delightful things now? But I actually think that this is a kind of technology that's going to be around a long time, even as patterns of computing change, that the idea that you can install these these interfaces everywhere is, has a very long future to it. Okay, so now we have a whole slew of questions here that I would call technical questions that maybe have one or two line answers, but people are very um, interested in them. And so let's go down the list and you guys just jump out and ask, ask, answer whichever one you think you can. So the first one that got the most upvotes here is from Matthew. Matthew o asks, what drives the looking glass? I think more important is the second half of this question. You know, do you have to connect it to a PC? And um, it, would you technically be able to create an inter, uh, uh, interactive using a, a Unity controller? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one um, at first. Uh, so the Looking Glass Portrait, which is the newest system, um, it's uh, designed to have two modes, a desktop mode and a standalone mode. That's because we wanted a way to have persistent holograms that you could load onto the system and just sit there and run um, all the time as real and persistent as objects in the world around you. So um, yes, it can uh, run without a computer. Um, it's got actually a little Raspberry Pi 4 in it with some special stuff done to it so that it can run holographic media. Um, but then for um, higher horsepower, um, higher compute requirement, what have you, applications that you might make in Unity, um, those can be uh, connected to a PC or Mac over HDMI, USB, and a USB cable. Um, and then any peripheral can be added, whether it's like a hand tracker, uh, phone for facial tracking, like vibe controllers, whatever, like all these peripherals could be added to that application. And then that content run in real time in that connected uh, looking glass. And that works not only for the looking glass portrait, but also our older systems as well. So we're trying to cover the bases for um, uh, sort of casual content that you want to look at all the time, but then deeper content that you want to engage with in an interactive way with those two modes. Excellent. Okay, so next, um, this is uh, they. Uh, th this is from uh, Zanathos, and for someone with limited knowledge and just starting to dabble in technology, is the leap motion sensor a necessity? Um, will I be losing out um, if I start creating content um, without it or some updated sensor? Um, no, I don't. I don't think you know. This is a creative choice to use a, a leap motion controller versus other um, interactive. Uh, peripherals out there. I don't think I don't think missing out is something that would happen, but I would also encourage um, you to use it and explore it and see if that's something that really jives with your creative process and something that you want to use for your work. Uh, it seemed to me like even there's a whole new branch of still photography or illustration to be explored here. Um, when you can view it that way. Okay, next uh, from John. Can the Looking Glass software use sequential shots of a model on a rotating base as an input? So this is a common uh, um, scanning technique, right? Um, and can it result those? Um, and I think there's a second part of this question that says, can it support 360 degrees of rotation? Is that something you do inside the device or, or, or with the device itself? Um. Yeah, so the, um, we have this uh, sort of main software suite called Hollow Place Studio, and that uh, pulls in a lot of different types of 3D content, whether that's uh, portrait mode photo, uh, RGBD depth video, um, yada, 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 all of this different type of 3D content and loads it onto the um, looking glass systems. Um, in there is support for uh, rail photography um, or panning shots, which essentially are catching, uh, capturing a number of different perspectives of the real world. And then the software processes that into a holographic still image, 
um, that really feels very, very real, capturing not only the three dimensionality of the real world, but also like refraction uh, through a magnifying glass or off of someone's glasses or whatnot. So it feels as if, I mean, it's, it's a very realistic representation of whatever you're capturing. Um, I'm getting to the answer. Uh, for the turntable capture, um, that is something that we'll add in a few months to Hollow Place Studio for direct support. So you would be able to put an, put an object, figurine, um, what have you, onto a turntable, capture a uh, number of images, and then pull that into the system. There's a one trick that is done to um, sort of correct for the angle of the different perspectives in software, but that's done automatically. So then at the, the result is you've essentially teleported something or replicated something that you see on the turntable in the looking glass. So that'll be supported directly in a few months. You can, you can hack your way to it um, like right now, basically, but it'll have direct support in a few months. All right, this should be a really easy one. Does the software work with three images from prior light field cameras, like specifically the Lytro L16? And David asked this question. Uh, Yes, um, uh, and actually I encourage folks to, there's a very active discussion around this in our uh, Discord community um, of folks who have old and some of the newer systems. Um, so there's been a lot of shared knowledge around this. It's look.glass slash Discord and you'll, can, you'll get in. Um, but anyway, um, what folks in the community found was that yes, there is depth, there's depth maps that can be extracted from those early Lytro cameras that aren't made anymore, but you can get the depth map and then because Hollow Play Studio, our software supports um, that import of um, depth map enabled photos, um, then, uh, then yeah, that can be pulled into the system. It's different than the rail or turntable light field captures that I was talking about a few minutes ago um, in that you don't get um, the super high fidelity captures um, that you get with that full light field photography, but um, anyway, this is a long-winded way of saying that, like, yeah, it, it does work, and um, folks are, are figuring out ways to get that type of content into their systems now. So you have another outlet. If you have managed to snag one of those light roads, you have an outlet for it. Okay, let's go back to a couple of conceptual things, and this one maybe bridges the conceptual with um, the business uh, side of things, it seems these days. And someone has asked a question, Michael here has added, asked a question about NFT. What is, are there any looking glass factory initiatives or connection or thoughts about the NFT hype, um, with your display and artists creations? Maybe we can give two different um, like perspectives on this because this is a raging debate in 3D land broadly, as I'm sure a lot of folks. On yeah, let's have it. I, <laughs> I've always thought NFTs are like, uh, and I don't understand it. I'm going to make a fool of myself, and I'm okay with that. But I think it feels like selling the graffiti, the wall behind the graffiti. <laughs> but at the same time, anything that puts money into an artist's hand, I think, is great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you kind of nailed it there. Um, there's an additional element of the concern of a lot of um, platforms have a really big carbon footprint and that's not debatable. That's like, that's the truth. Um, some of the newer platforms uh, are solving that, but newer as in like in the last few weeks, um, but that's a real issue. Um, so all of this um, is boiling in this raging debate around NFT artwork. We have decided to do a limited number of experiments with artists that we're close to um, in a response, what we view as a responsible, um, limited engagement way um, so that we can understand how some of the artists in our community are making and could potentially make money um, with their creations in a holographic um, platform like the Looking Glass. So we, um, we did the first holographic NFT with two artists, uh, Reggie Watts and Panther Modern, uh, uh, about a month ago, something like that. Um, and we're considering doing additional experiments, but um, it's, uh, it'll, it's experimental right now. Um, Missy. Well, um, how about you, Missy? You have, any drop, yeah. you have any drops coming that we should <laughs> be aware of? Um, I mean, I think, uh, 
you know, this is just my viewpoint, but at the end of the day, like we make a holographic display. And so like, we definitely want to support um, art and artists. And um, yeah, that's kind of like where, you know, I all, there's all of these uh, different conflicts with in terms of NFT have made me a little um, reserved and cautious in terms of kind of discussing it. Um, uh, it, it's also happening so fast. And so I think we should also be aware of the fact that like, we weren't talking about this uh, a month and a half ago or two months ago at all. Um, and like these things do that. Um, what I'm not gonna do is tell someone not to make art and um, I'm not gonna you know, tell them it's not art. Um, that's not my job. I, I wanna see amazing holograms on the display. So that's my diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, a the very I, as was mine greatly hedged and i think that just reveals how little we understand about the current situation or or where it's going to go from here but i you know the first time someone probably you know walked into ancient london surrounded by some wall to ward off the romans and said hey let's auction off this art <laughs> people were probably uh, had similar discussions going on so i think in the world of art there's nothing better than talking about it and letting the money flow uh, it's a very valuable part of our our society okay um Someone asked, uh, let's go back to a quick tactical questions. Um, Mike here asks, is Unity a preferred game engine over Unreal to create for Looking Glass? I think better would, you could expand that out too, because someone also asked, what's a good coding language that works well along with Looking Glass? So maybe you could expand out to like, what's a nice stack or uh, what are the real comfortable, good, nice stacks to, to explore if you're going to do more interactive work? or more 3D work with, with the looking glass? Um, well, I think uh, we've tried to do a lot of work to um, fit in with people's existing workflows. Um, so that's why we have the Unity plugin, we have the Unreal plugin, we have a Hollow Play Core, which is um, uh, C++. Um, like we're, uh, we've been doing a lot of work to make sure, to try to fit in with as many creators as possible. So it kind of just depends on um, what you feel most comfortable creating in. Um, I will admit that um, Unity plugin is is really great, but I can speak to that because I'm a Unity dev. Um, I'm not an, a, as strong as an Unreal dev, but there are people that are strong on, a, on our team. And so I think that also just highlights my, my previous perspective, which is it's a kind of like pick your holographic poison. Um, yeah. Sean, here's a great question for you. This is probably both technical and theoretical, but it's one that piqued my interest. It speaks to the future capabilities of the technology other than the size of the display, which is what do you think the next step is in terms of the evolution of the hologram itself? Is this about greater depth? Is it about multiple panes? Is it about the shark and you know, uh, uh, back to the future that dives out or the giant joy displays in Blade Runner 2049. Uh, where, where do we need to go next with holograms to continue to um, advance them in the way that humans want to embrace them? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we've, we've made a bet with what we're doing with Looking Glass Portrait and these additional tools that we're rolling out like Hollow Play Studio that can process photos and videos of saying that, um, <laughs> it seems so obvious to even say, that having people like inside these systems and creating memories and representing those memories holographically and then being able to share those with other folks who have Looking Glasses is where this is going next. And that's what we're diving into a lot right now. Um, there is a future uh, where there, and this is not that far away, but there's a future where there's different size and format and you know whatnot uh, looking glasses in our lives in a whole bunch of different um, ways. There'll be small ones that maybe have a holographic character that represents the voice of a voice AI like in your home. And then there'll be larger ones that allow you to have a holographic communication with um, colleagues or a little bit later, friends and family, as it gets into more folks' hands. 
Um, so it's going to be pretty broad based. We're going in really deep on your memories and things that you feel um, particularly um, strongly about. Uh, photo, video, um, 3D creations that you've made, characters you've made and whatnot. And that's kind of implicit in what we've done with uh, the rollout of Looking Last Portrait and all of those tools. Um, so, uh, so we're trying to we're trying to work on already what is um, what's next, I guess, in that respect. So the simply the hollow deck is what we need to get right? <laughs> from Star Trek. So someone asked a question that that probably speaks to the current capabilities of the device, which is the and maybe this is just an aspect of the videos, or maybe you can ask answer it for us. They, they say everything's horizontal. Is there vertical uh, uh, movement as well, translation, or and that, that's just not shown as often? Uh, it's a, uh, um, it, it's a, uh, for the technical, um, uh, the technical answer is it's horizontal parallax only. So the 3D only happens in a horizontal view, but it's, you know, our eyes happen to also be horizontal, which is nice. So it's not as if the illusion breaks when you like do this like up and down with the display, you just can't see over top of a character's head or you know underneath a table, um, a holographic table in the system. Um, and we've that's that's been a deliberate uh, decision that we've made to conserve some resolution for those horizontal perspectives and whatnot. Um, but there's always a lot of stuff cooking in the background. I'll also say. In our <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I, that's I'm I'm fond. Every now and then in my career, people have come to me and asked me to um, create a 3D uh, interface. Like Je Jeff Bezos was this guy who came and asked once for his his Fire Phone, um, and uh, I'm fond of reminding uh, people that w w we don't see in 3D. Uh, we are not dolphins. We are not bats. So we actually see in two and a half D, we see in parallax. And if you go into a library, you will find books shelved lovingly in two dimension down a big long row so we can scan them. A 3D library would have books in a cube because it'd be more space efficient. And if you could see in 3D, you would that would be uh, useful. So that's a very good point in that you we talk a lot about 3D, but um, 3D in the artist's hand really should regard, really take acknowledge of, of, of the human capability of, as a parallax vision system. Um, the, there are definitely a lot of more questions here that we are probably not going to get to. I'm going to try and pick out a really good last one, but just um, there are a lot of people asking about the applications in medical. I know from uh, Magic Leap and HoloLens perspective, uh, just the holographic world in medical is huge. And I can see a lot of advantages to having a display over uh, um, a heads up display in different situations. Um, people are, um, uh, uh, last technical, maybe this is one we could we could meet, up, meet on. Um, conceptually, do you think you could create a network of multiple devices each with different images to create a more immersive live share content with these. Is that a matter of cost and the number of devices and the complexity of programming or, or uh, what do you think? Uh, any of this stuff is, is, is possible. And I don't say that flippantly. I mean, the, um, this is a very scalable technology. Um, so there will be all forms of this in the future um, and the not not infinitely distant future. So the answer is like, yeah. And some folks in the community have already like tiled together systems, looking glass systems, for instance, we've done that. Um, and there'll be more forms of this in the uh, near future, I think from both us as a company and also from the community. Yeah. That is the the good answer, right, uh, Missy? So I give give you each like an opportunity to just give us a closing thought. Like you've seen where the discussion has gone. If you look in the in the chat, every people have been really fired up um, to talk about like this history of three D photography and that this is an interesting moment in time that could see a resurgence of that. And you know, just give us a, a closing thought each. Uh, uh, Sean, you first, then Missy. And uh, then we'll be pretty close to done. Oh, great. Well, I, I want to say that this has been super fun. And thanks for uh, having us as being a uh, part of this. Um, and these have been awesome questions. Um, 
you know, we're, we're at the phase now of for holographic light field display technology, like what we do with looking glass, where it's kind of the equivalent of, you know, when the Wright brothers were trying to prove that heavier than air human flight was possible. And they like flew around the Statue of Liberty and did a press tour to prove that this was possible. So we're excited that folks are getting these systems and it's demystifying what, um, you know, these can do and that it's not some fantasy in the infinitely distant future, but it's stuff that folks can start to create on now. Um, and hope to see some of the folks who were in this session in the community, um, in Discord and elsewhere, talking about what they dream of um, uh, on top of these new systems. And again, just really great to be here. Closing thoughts, Missy? I mean, yeah, if anyone has more questions or wants to talk, definitely join our Discord or email me, missy at lookingglassfactory.com. Fantastic. Um, yeah. But yeah, like anyone that is creating in this space or, you know, is about to get their hands on a portrait and, you know, you really are going to be um, discovering novel, um, you know, new ways to, to interact and create in the 3D space. And um, I really look forward to seeing what anyone here or everyone here creates because it's all it's a it's a community process at this point now we're like building it all together well th thank you um i have to say in my career as an interactive artist it was a new technology in the world of fidgets and these micro modular computers that launched me into a whole new creative endeavor and i just urge the audience the makers the creators in the audience that um you know, sometimes a purchase like this, and for me, it was an ultra short throw projector and a box of fidgets can make a huge difference in your entire career um, just to give you the motivation to play something. So I recognize that same resonance here, which is why I was so excited to host this session. Thank you, Missy and Sean for creating the device and showing us what amazing experiences could be on it. I would like once again to thank our sponsors uh, Looking Glass Factory and Media Temple for making today's sessions possible. If you have questions that didn't get answered, don't worry. They'll be hanging around and we'll get answered later. And as we mentioned at the beginning, eh, we selected someone who is going to get a Looking Glass portrait. And that person is, where is it in the channel here? Someone gave it to me. Thank you, Osuna Perez. Thank you for your questions. You are the one. Uh, someone from FITC will reach out with you later today uh, and give you details on how to claim your prize. And we can't wait to see what you make with it. Um, final announcement. This is going to seem, um, but, um, you know, later this April, FITC Toronto is happening again. Um, this event started a long time ago. In fact, this is the 20th year anniversary. It starts on April 19th. This year, it's going to be virtual, which, um, but also it's going to be probably one of the most amazing lineups ever. Um, pretty much everyone who I was watching little conference presentations of um, that inspired me to get into art, to buy ultra short throw projectors, and ultimately to get on stage and speak myself is going to be speaking at this conference. It's a really powerful lineup. And as virtual, um, it means that you can not only experience it live, but go back and watch sessions. So unlike that classic uh, problem we always had at FITC, which was, I'm going to miss this if I go to that. You can see it all this year um, uh, online. So go and buy tickets. It, um, it's going to be a really good thing. And um, yes, I am speaking as well, uh, along with some uh, really powerful designer, Steven Sagmeister, Aaron Draplin, Chantel Martin is speaking. Uh, some of the really amazing, Mario Klingerman talk about the world. Uh, uh, we were talking about the world of NFT. Uh, 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 this guy, Beeple, it might be showing up. And my favorite author of all times, Cory Doctorow. Read all of his books if you want to know what the future is like. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you at the next sessions.
is the great Lester Young.